welcome back to another short film Saturdays here at Soleil Space's YouTube channel. We are so excited to have you all here today because we have another two amazing films, another two amazing filmmakers, new week, but you know, this I don't want to say the same stuff because it's amazing new different films, but like same caliber. Same high, 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 high bar of quality. My name is Nase De Sanders, and I'm the community outreach manager here at Soleil Space. Let me tell you a little bit about Soleil Space before we jump into it. So we're a media company based in Brooklyn, New York. Our mission is to achieve a more equitable and representative global film and television landscape. Our focus is on the global diasporas of Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean and the Middle East, with the goals of elevating untold stories from these cultures, forming closer transcultural community bonds and providing opportunities and resources for our creators to produce premium world-class content. We specialize in film, TV, editorial media, and aim to uplift those underrepresented voices that are not seen authentically represented or well understood in the global mainstream media. And we know, no better way to do that them with short films. Shorts are often the purest form of artistic expression and often, they're not always, executed within the boundaries of smaller production budgets. Since launching Short Film Saturdays in late summer of 2021, we have featured a whopping 75 films from 61 filmmakers in 27 countries to date, and we are adding to those numbers today with our two lovely guests, Omar Kakar and Aksa Alta. Let me tell you a little bit about our guests. Omar Kakar is an inter a disciplinary architect turned filmmaker and a first generation Afghan American. His cross cultural upbringing led him into art, design, and cinema. He holds a professional BA degree from Woodbury University School of Architecture and earned his MFA in film as a directing candidate from Columbia University in the city of New York. So, first, Omar, can you tell us a little bit about what we're going to be watching today, your film, Man in the Morgue? Um, yeah, first, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm actually embarrassed to say, I don't know how to describe my own film. Um, I think like the common denominator word that comes up when people see it is it's weird. So be ready to see a weird film. Perfect. Weird is my absolute favorite. So no complaints there. <laughs> Then we have Aksa Alta. Aksa is a Los Angeles-based writer and director. She was raised in Kuwait by Muslim, Pakistani, and Sri Lankan parents who were migrant workers. She immigrated to the U.S. in 2013. She wrote and directed the Disney short film American Eid for season one of the NAACP Image Awards nominated series Disney Launchpad. Her films have premiered at festivals like South by Southwest and the Claremont Claremont Ferrand International Short Film Festival and have been shortlisted for the BAFTA Film Awards. She was nominated for the Young Director Award in 2019 at Cannes Lions. And in addition to her narrative work, Aksa also directs commercials and branded films. She is currently developing her first feature and TV projects. Aksa, welcome. Please tell us a little bit about what we're going to see today, Zafar. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm actually super excited, especially on tomorrow. I'm excited to see your film and hear from you. Um, it's just such a pleasure to always hear from other filmmakers, especially after you watch that film. Um, I, I feel like with Zephyr, it's such a personal, it's really hard for me to talk about it objectively sometimes. When I, it's, It depends. There are, there are moments where I can just talk about it objectively as a filmmaker all day long, but then there are moments where I'm like, yeah, it's just, it's so personal. It comes from such a, it's such a space of like, just need to tell the story at that moment and point in my life. Um, and it, it, it really helped heal me because it is based on uh, an event that I went through. So in a way, yeah, it was cathartic. It was therapeutic. And at the same time, it it's, I, I find it hard to express, express myself with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that's why I made the film. That's my way of telling th those feelings and putting them visually out there to kind of get it out there because words are not enough. So yeah. that's the fur for me. Beautiful. So we are so, so excited to watch these two films. So for those who may be joining us for the first time, here is how it's going to go. We are going to watch these two films, The Bar first and then Man in the Morgue second, back to back. And then after the credits start rolling, do not go anywhere because we're going to come right back here for a Q&A with these two amazing filmmakers. Where we dive into the cultural aspects and we get into that nitty gritty of these amazing short films. And then at the end of that, we are taking audience questions. So if you have questions, hold on to them and please submit them at the end so we can ask the filmmakers and find out even more. This is YouTube, so you know I have to say it. Like and subscribe, hit that bell notification. And with that, let's enjoy the films. Hey, 
Hey, everybody, welcome back. For those who may be just joining us, this is Short Film Saturdays. I am here joined by amazing filmmakers, Aksa Altaf and Omar Kakar, and we have just watched their films, Zafar and Man in the Morgue, in that order. And so now we're going to hop into the Q&A in the same order. So Aksa, we are starting with you, Zafar. What inspired you to tell this story, and what is your personal connection to the subject matter? Um, yeah, I... So for, for me, <clears throat> the inspiration for the story came because I was doing an Uber commercial last year or a, a year and a half ago at the beginning of the year. And it was like a documentary commercial with all these Uber drivers that were doing share um, writing like customers, but also like doing food delivery. And one of the things that was common amongst, I spoke to so many dri drivers all over the country, like I flew to different cities. And every single Uber driver that was doing food delivery said it was like the most stressful job. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, you think about it and you just take it for granted. Somebody just drops your food, you take them for granted, but then you don't know all the stuff that's happening, like finding the address, the GPS doesn't work. Uber has one of the worst navigation systems apparently. Yes. And they also like treat the workers, like if you don't deliver the food on time, if you're like two minutes late, like you get, the people that like, give you low star rate, starting like, you know, ratings, and then you get basically fired from uh, from the company. And it's just to me was fascinated how these people like one of them I met was an immigrant who was dealing with like having a family back home and he was taking care of them and he was taking care of like around 10 people back home you know um he was a he was an afghan refugee so it was kind of like this 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 i related to that because i also moved here immigrated here and i was taking care of my family so this story like stuck with me for a long time and i wanted to tell something in that world i just thought it was a fascinating viewpoint into the working class and then when i went through um when my dad passed away at the height of the pandemic the emotion of dealing with that and the world of this just kind of melded together and the story came and it was a way for me to just, um, I guess, start the process of grieving to uh, to make it an objective thing to process it objectively, so I can grieve. Um, but yeah, that was kind of like the genesis. Wow, that's absolutely beautiful. So then, so far as almost entirely a single location shoot. So how did you go about writing the script to keep the story so engaging, despite having a protagonist who essentially for most of the film is either sitting on the phone or standing on the phone? You know, it's kind of, uh, was a difficult thing. Cause when I started writing it, I was like, okay, this takes place mostly in a car, which in itself is so challenging to film one. Yes. Also, I was very, very afraid that I would, I would run out of like, um, shots like how am I going to make this interesting after a while how am I going to keep telling the narrative story and what I I realized is that it's so interesting you think about that and then you actually start filtering the shot design through your character arc and the narrative of the story and how the narrative progresses and it's not that hard to do it like you, you after a while you're like oh okay I don't need that much coverage this is the shot is enough for me to tell the story the shot is enough for me to tell the story and it was very important for me to not come back to the same shot in the car um so and there was this one particular moment it's a long take of uh of our actor smile uh we're the camera is with him it's a side profile close up um and it goes on for like good like close to 50 seconds and it's just one long take and I didn't have to edit around that like even though I had coverage because the performance was just so engaging and good and so that was my really that was my one of the biggest revelations is that you shouldn't get intimidated right off the bat like oh this will be limit limit limiting to me from a from an execution point of view. I think if you filter everything from a character arc progression, you'd be amazed how much options you have yeah. in shot design. Um, but yeah, like I think shooting shooting in the limited space was a blessing in disguise in the sense that it forced me to become more creative with my and think about how shot design from a very 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 character. Um, point of view as opposed to just doing it because it looks cool you know yeah very cool so then in the film we definitely see there's a lot of deep like a lot of detail shown to the lives of those in the background of this film so we have the children screaming while they're playing or something at the money transfer place we have the baby crying inside at the final delivery stop we have the radio host discussing likability I think it is so can you tell us how and why you made those choices in the production of this film? Yeah, I feel like for me, the biggest thing was when I, so my dad, when I got the call about my dad being sick, um, 
I was here and he was in Pakistan. And I just had to go about my life as if like nothing was happening. Like nobody around me was understanding all the shit was going on. Um, you know, like me dealing with all these things and life was just happening. And not that those people were wrong. They did not know what was happening with me. And I did not want to go and tell every person I met, like I'm dealing with all this. And I just thought it was very interesting how we work. Like we go about society, but we never think what this person is going through, what this person is going through. And somebody, somebody might mess up your Uber Eats and there might be a very strong reason for that. Um, you know, and even with Hannah, like that person, I didn't want her to make quote unquote an antagonist, like, like she's having a baby at home. She's probably a new mother. She probably hasn't slept in days. And this food yeah. is the one thing she's been waiting for. For her that week, that food messed up was the worst thing that could happen to her. And obviously she doesn't know like this guy is dealing with all this behind the scenes. Yeah. So I just think it's very fascinating how um, we just go about life and we never think about like, okay, well, what is this person potentially going through? And everything is so relative. You know, for Hannah, that's the worst week because she's a new mother for him. It's the worst because of that. And I just, I find that to be so fascinating. How can you compare and contrast your issues with each other? Yeah. Um, especially if your relative bubbles are not colliding. Had she known, I think she would feel like absolute shit for even yeah, doing no, all that. Right. Um, so yeah, but objectively observing that I thought was fascinating. Mm -hmm. I always think about that all the time, especially because I went through that do documenting all those Uber driver stories. Yeah. It made me just go like, wow, there's so much behind the scenes that happened. Absolutely. Very interesting. I think Hannah is definitely the best example of that at the end, because we hear the baby crying, but we also hear who I'm assuming is her partner, the male voice. It's like, Hannah, mm -hmm. I'm like, you are in the house too. You get the baby. She's yeah. out trying to get the food and exactly. now she's run back inside. I'm like, she's got a lot going on too, clearly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She has an asshole for a partner. <laughs> yeah, but like still with just like two background sounds, the crying and the Hannah you immediately are starting to get a glimpse into what she has going on. You're like, all right, everyone in the background of the story is, tr is truly going through their own stuff. It's very, it's very, very interesting to see how, how you manage to convey that with so little. Absolutely wonderful. So then a lot of the times on Strap Club Saturdays, we like to ask about how different audiences reacted to a film. But for this one specifically, I would like to know how your family members reacted to this film since it is so personal to you and something your family had gone through did they also find the film rather cathartic or what was what was their reaction you know we uh because my entire family is split between Pakistan and Sri Lanka I'm the only one here um after my dad passed away I haven't been back home mm. so um it just doesn't feel like, I feel like we were all grieving in our own different way, in our own different bubbles, in our own different countries. Like that's just the reality of uh, of how how the situation is for our specific family. Yeah. And we, we all talk about it, but we haven't really talked about grieving. We all talk about like my dad and we all talk about like every month the anniversary my mom will count. Mm -hmm. So I think that's our way of grieving, but we haven't really talked about like what are how are we individually grieving like what yeah. when are those moments when all those emotions come back to you how are you handling that when you're at work and all those emotions just bubble up yeah. and um when I made the film my my sister watched it and she said she messaged me she goes like I was just crying the whole time and we had like a moment together we spoke about like how it is to grieve mm -hmm. and I was like this is crazy that it took us a year and a half after all that happened for us to actually talk uh, mm -hmm. about it and it was because because we were able to objectively see it in our film. Yeah. It was just easier to talk about it with the proxy in yeah. the middle as opposed to directly doing it. And uh, and uh, having that proxy helped us actually access all these deeper emotions. And it just made me realize that's like, that's filmmaking. And that's when filmmaking does it really best and makes it personal is when you can use it to access your own emotions that you cannot inherently, you're scared to access it yourself. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that's a healthy way to deal with things, yeah. but sometimes that's the way to deal with things, you know, like that's how it is, um, uh, with some people. So yeah, so it was definitely personal. I don't think all my family members have watched, like, I don't think my mom has watched it. So I don't want to force her to watch it just as of yet until she's ready. But my siblings, um, my siblings and I had a very cathartic experience through it. Okay. okay. That's beautiful. And so do you think your experience is representative of the way a lot I mean ex except for the film part that part is quite unique to you and your family but <laughs> otherwise this experience of 
grieving someone who has died very far away and having a family that's quite split up. So not being able to, I don't want to say grieve in the traditional way because the traditional way of grieving is so completely different for everyone everywhere. But in the sense that there's this inability to, like you were saying, connect with one another over this um, thing that this thing that's happened to the family. Um, do you find that that is typical for immigrant families who are quite split up? That, oh yeah, that, like my first year here, because when I immigrated here, um, I had to take care of my family. I mean, I still do like, but it was harder back then because I was yeah. like fresh in a new country, uh, finances were tight. Like, so it was this idea, like I, I was so homesick. I was missing them so much. I felt so much guilt leaving, yeah. but at the same time, everything that every time that phone rang, I knew it was bad news. I knew like they needed money. I needed something. And I felt so guilty even thinking that. You know, and the phone became an antagonist to me that first year. It was just a, it was a source of stress. Every time I look at it, I knew. And then it kind of tainted my relationship with them because I'm like, maybe they're just calling to check on me, you know, but it always was, on the, on, there was an underlying, because when you're the only source of income, you, you become that person, even to yourself, you know, so you cannot see yourself apart, apart from that. Um, so, and so that's why I felt like in this one and the shot design choices, this idea of like phone having, a very big presence from a sound design, even from a shot design, it gets close ups, very, in, very like extreme close ups and inserts. Uh, it was important to me because for me, like the phone was an antagonist. It was a way for me to keep in touch with my family, but at the same time, it also brought all this stress while I was navigating uh, being an immigrant in an American society, quote unquote. Um, which is very, which for my first couple of years felt very cold, very individualistic compared to where I come from. Yeah. Um, just everybody's all about you, me, 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 me. It's all about like career, all about surviving. Yeah. And just nobody has time to stop and like check on you, you know? And at the same time, like life is just happening. Like kids are doing TikTok on the side of the road. Kids are screaming at the Western Union. Yep. Um, that's another location, Western Union, just triggers me so much because I used to go there so much. I do it online now, but I used to like actually go to Western Union. Um, and it's just this most stressful place. Mm. Wow, that is powerful powerful stuff so then my last question for you before we hop over to omar the symbolism of the splitting glass i found to be very powerful can you talk us through what it means and why you chose to include it that was a very um that was a very like instinctive choice i made i i kind of felt like this idea of like oh there was this at any moment this could just shatter like that was the that was the intention because I, I remember when I was on those calls I was trying to be very optimistic but deep within I just had a very 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 bad feeling that this entire journey is not going to end well yeah. uh with my dad because he was he had COVID it was the height of Delta pandemic um he did not have access to beds the oxygen the ventilators everywhere were out and I just like all the facts were telling me this is not going to end well but I had I, I held on so tight to this hope and I felt like that felt like that crack in the glass where I was like I know there is a crack I see there is a crack I know this is bad but I'm gonna hold on to the fact that it's not and in the end I don't know why I still don't know why because uh, when I was first writing it everybody was like oh it's obvious the crack has to crack the whole thing has to just crack in the end but I just made it disappear and I still to this day do not know why that I made that choice but I just felt like that was the right choice to make like it just felt like it felt like that that crack leaving that and it almost feels like it kind of went into his psyche as opposed to yeah. it being outside. Like he is not the same person anymore. So the crack became more of a, from there on, I felt like my psychology was not the same. I was a different person. I, when you lose somebody, you're a different person. Yeah. So to me, like, I felt like when he saw that going, he was just a different person. So that was the ending of the film for me. It just felt like a, the next breath on, it would be a different story almost. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, very nice. Alrighty, Omar, now we have some questions for you. We are shifting over from the death of a family member to the death of the self, question mark. <laughs> Let's find out. So I wanna start even before the first frame of the film begins. We start with a quote from Dhammapada. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I'm so sorry if I am. So for the audience, who is this person and what is the significance of this quote to the film? You know, 
whenever I start any project, I just like gather in as much like resources and materials just for myself to build up this world uh, of influence. And um, as I shoot the project, I, in the back of my head, I have like music and quotes and imagery just like plays in me to like help me stay in that spirit as we shoot the film. And this quote was just so provocative. I, I read it several years ago and just like had it down in my notes. Um, and it just like kept resonating with me during the process of making this film that uh, I'm like, I need to include it. And, and when you're a filmmaker, you, you have to be mindful of the audience. Um, so you're a storyteller, you're a showman. So I knew in the short film format, usually these films are screened with a group of other films. Um, so having this quote really prep, you know, the audience to like, you know, you, you're gonna, you're about to experience something uh, along these lines. Very nice, very cool. So then what inspired you to create this film? You know, if anything, I, I was so deeply uninspired during the time of like putting this film together um, with the state of affairs in the world. It's, it's just, it's so miserable looking out, seeing what's going on in the world. Um, and at the time I was like deeply in marinating in these thoughts that um, I decided to unplug from like the distractions and when you unplug from like social media, the news and all the horrific things that are going going on, um, you like left to think uh, inwardly. And I tend to come down to death in my mortality. Mm. Um, and so like these existential like feelings start to like bubble up. And at the time I was working with a very talented friend of mine who's a screenwriter from Iceland. We were developing a couple of short scripts. And one of the scripts had this one protagonist who's an embalmer in the morgue. And I asked him, like, hey, can I just like pluck this character out of this project that we're working on and put him into this whole other story that's like bubbling up with me right now? Um, and he's like, yeah. And so from there, I just uh I was just intrigued by this this man in the morgue and what that existence entails. And and I find death just so morbid and alarming and I just like think about un unhealthily too much that uh to work in a morgue would just be so difficult for me so I just wanted mm -hmm. to like explore that experience and again with all the, the world building that I keep in like my notebooks I just start to draw from like other influences from like gothic literature and German expressionism and just like built up uh this this psychological character study very cool so then like if we are completely disregarding the audience entirely for a second what does this film and this exploration of mortality mean to you what was what were you representing what were you expressing about yourself only through this film this is such a hard question to answer really? and I'm so <laughs> <laughs> I'm so embarrassed as like the filmmaker to to not even know how to explain it. There there is a, a particular specific meaning that I have. Um, I just didn't go in willy nilly, just like shoot things. Um, oh, but it, it, it there was such a challenge to like convey this to my co writer, the producers. They're like, "What the hell is this?" Yeah. Um, and, and then making it, and then screening it, and then people screaming like, "This is." what's what does this mean what, what is that supposed to represent and um I I learned the lesson I made a promise to myself after one specific interaction with someone who, who very much loved the film but after I talked to her and I explained exactly what it meant to me I I saw like her enthusiasm uh and joy just like wash away oh, and just yeah. be like it's like she literally told me like no like, that's not what this means like you, you didn't you didn't mean that in in my own film and um I the lessons I learned I'm like you know what I, I can't directly explain this to people because they're going to come with their own experiences and inter interpretations of it yes. that uh anything that I say is just going to ruin it um so I, I I don't even know how to answer that. I I just don't. I just like tiptoe around it and yeah and ex explain this explanation of how I I can't 
explain it because if I do, it just it just ruins the whole uh, experience. Totally. Uh, no. I, I, I'll say that I, as a filmmaker, just as a human being, I enjoy the mystery of things. Yeah. Um. So I just like to deepen the mystery. Very cool. Very, very cool. So then the location of this film, location it was shot in, and a little bit about these dead body props slash the lack thereof. I know there's quite the story around it. Can you please, please tell us? <laughs> Right. This is something that we briefly talked about before doing this. Um, this is such a long story, but the whole production of this film was just so wild and such a challenge that um the the film was awarded a production grant and um and we had a set date deadline that we need to shoot, otherwise I had to return the money back to the to the people who financed the films. Okay. Finance the film. And um, at a certain point, our our producer dropped from the project, and I was scrambling to crew up and find another producer. Um, that we went past the shooting dates, and we we're approaching the deadline. And the deadline was like mid winter, <laughs> and so by the time I got the skeleton crew together and a producer on board. It, it was mid-December um, and people were gone for Christmas and the holidays and New Year's. And so well, <laughs> the, the whole experience was just so rushed together mm. that uh, there were some challenges that were brought about on the weekend that we shot. So the weekend we selected ended up being one of the coldest weekends of the year in New York, um, there was an, a polar vortex in the northeast of the U.S. during that time, and so it was like literally like ten degrees Fahrenheit or like negative ten degrees Celsius. Um, shooting the exteriors uh, one night after we finished shooting, I was a part of the equipment van, uh, returning uh, the van to the garage and the driver actually hit another car. And so there was an, an accident after like a 12 hour shoot and having to wait for like NYPD to show up, uh, in the cold, uh, was like several hours that, um, by the time that was all done, we trained home. There was no, enough, there was not enough time to sleep. I had to like go into like the next day to shoot. And I was very, very ill. I think I caught the flu because I was throwing up constantly. Oh um, my gosh. The, the day we shot in the hotel room, um, I carried around like a bucket. So I just kept throwing up. And I, I, I don't even remember the whole process of like shooting that part of the film. Um, and that led into the next day shooting in a morgue, an active morgue on Roosevelt Island in New York City. Um, Roosevelt Island is like this very sliver of land in between Manhattan and uh, um, Queens and Brooklyn. And at the very tip of that island, there's a hospital. And at that hospital, we were able to secure shooting in their morgue. Um, and they had a little autopsy room that was inactive that just, they just kept as storage. Um, but the actual more with the cooling chambers was an active thing that the hospital used. And so I had this like looming threat over the production that uh, if someone were to have passed away, um, they would have to stop the production to actually bring in the recently deceased <laughs> to use the cooling chambers. Um, yeah, <laughs> I feel like I've been rambling, but... Uh, Not at all. This is super it, interesting. So were there actual dead bodies on set then in those little cooling chambers? So the, we had two um, actors slash models that, that uh, performed as the cadavers uh, yeah. in a couple of those shots. But uh, the day that we arrived at the morgue, um, I was just looking at, um, I was setting up my shots and there's one particular shot that I shoot from inside the cooling chamber. And mm -hmm. for whatever reason, there was some miscommunication um, with production and in the hospital 
where they're supposed to keep this particular cooling chamber free for our production and the other cooling chamber for the actual uh, cadavers that um, I walked in. Um, it's very, there's no light inside. It's just dark. And I have to keep the door closed because um, there's an alarm on the cooling chambers. If it were to stay uh, open for too long, the temperatures rise and like the alarm goes, just, will just go off. Um, that I know it's like, there was just like stuff in there, like, gurneys with like sheets and I just thought um uh some of the PAs of the producer just like used that temporarily the space is like storage as I like moved out the rest of the gurneys from the autopsy room um that uh, I went over to uh, ask uh one of the producers I'm like hey can we like take out the these extra gurneys out of the clean chambers we need to put the camera in there and she's like there there is no extra gurneys in the clean chairs like yes there's like i walked over and as i was opening the door i'm like oh you know what oh, no. i opened the door to, to show more lights i'm like oh these are actually recently deceased people was wrapped up in sheets uh on the gurney and um it's just like wave of like spookiness like i like fell on production that i i ended up closing the door I'm like okay no one goes in here ever again yeah. um so yeah, it, just the whole experience just concentrated in this like very cold weekend was just very wild and unforgettable. Absolutely, that is so crazy, insane. Alrighty, so now I have some questions for the two of you. My first one, both films take very different approaches to reaching a similar end, death. So what are each of you trying to say about death? in these films. Actually, I feel like we've touched on it a little bit, but if you want to elaborate further, uh, and Omar, if you want to say nothing at all, that's also totally fine. <laughs> so whoever wants to go first. Yeah, I think for me, it's just, this movie isn't really about the aftermath of death because it is about leading to death. Like, you know, the film ends with that. So I think the thing that I realized with life is, um, you can go about doing the most mundane shit in your life to survive. And then at the end of the day, you're reminded that what's actually important, you know, and uh, and sometimes it's too late when you're reminded, you know, um, and that's kind of what I felt with, with with moving here. And I'm chasing my dreams, trying to become like a filmmaker. And I left my family behind, hoping that I can become a filmmaker to bring them here. But then death comes in the way and ruins your plan. And you're like, what does this what does this, any of this mean? So for me, I think death is a reminder of the 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 filter. It's really the filter of the most essential thing in your life and makes you go like, wow, uh, what exactly is your priority in life? And what does any of this mean to you? And it makes you really, really, really hone it. Um, so yeah, I think, gosh, that's why there's so much stuff written about death. Yeah. <laughs> anybody can ever anybody can ever get close to what it means. It just teaches you something at that point in your life. Yeah. Very well said. And Omar, how about you? It's I, I have to piggyback. It's it's definitely touching on the whole memento mori uh, aspect of you know death is it's a reminder. It's around the corner. It's everywhere. Um, the whole universe entropy is this you know death. Um, and as a filmmaker, it's a I don't I don't have any answers. But making these films is just an exploration for oneself to just uh, have. Uh, a conversation with your own soul and then a dialogue with you know what it means to be alive and experience reality beautiful we are getting deep on short film saturdays today <laughs> <laughs> early in the morning and we are we're talking about life and death here <laughs> so my next question for the two of you you both come from immigrant backgrounds and have experienced being raised by parents who did not share the dominant culture of where you were living so how do you each feel your upbringing has affected your artistic voice or influenced, I should say, your artistic voice? Yeah, that's a very deep question for me. I have like an interesting background because like I was raised in Kuwait and uh, we were migrants there. So we were, so that was, my parents were immigrants there, quote unquote, but, uh, but their immigrant experience was different from mine because it was just, you know, the way in Kuwait, they don't give you citizenship. You would never really become part of the country. So it was always very, very temporary for them. Um, so I just immediately assumed 
I never felt like I'd had a home per se, quote unquote. Like I never, I, now I can't even go back to my childhood home. My family doesn't live there anymore. My apartment I used to live there probably doesn't exist. Wow. Um, so it's just interesting to think about home in that sense. And then when I immigrated here, that's what I thought. It should, I, I pulled from their experience of what immigration means. And then I realized it's a little different for me here. Like I'm getting more permanency here than they did there. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I had to like understand like this, I kind of had to make home of this and kind of find what the meaning of home means. Yeah. Um. So for me, though, my experience of storytelling kind of comes from that idea of like mm-hmm. home and identity and family and leaving them behind. All of that is such like important themes for me that I feel like I keep coming back to um, because I'm trying to figure it out yeah. uh, from, from all these different lenses of growing up there, coming here yeah. and growing up here. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Omar, how about you? Yeah, it, it very much plays a role in my existence and composition as like a human being and and therefore a filmmaker. You know, my parents, uh, my entire family immigrated from Afghanistan and um, it's a very unique region of the world. It's like sandwiched in between huge power blocks of different cultures. You have China to the east and Iran to the west and Pakistan, India to the south, and you got like the Turks slash Russia to the north. So it's a very co it's a co-ethnic country and it's just a mix of vibrant art and and culture yeah. that uh that definitely played into like my upbringing. So like I was in a household where my parents would listen to Afghan music, Iranian music, music from India, Arabic, you know, and and it wasn't seen as like oh like we're exposing you to like the arts that was just our existence to like take in different cultural art and the exposure to like I think abstract art where our whole floor was just flooded with Afghan rugs and just seeing that patterns I just remember as a kid just staring at it just traversing just the different patterns of it and trying to figure out any rhyme or reason to why it is what it is and so I, I don't know how that exactly translated over to what I do now, but it definitely is um, a mix and influences just the, the extractions I have when it meets Western media yeah. and what I create. Very interesting. And then a follow up to that question. Did either of your parents share films from their con- well, their cultures with you growing up? For me, it was so Bollywood heavy. Like, really? Like, uh, it was just so Bollywood heavy. So, yeah, like, not, nothing I do it has anything Bollywood related, but I'm like, it would be interesting to make a musical down the road. <laughs> I did grow up with so much of that. But um, I did, I used to watch some Pakistani movies in Sri Lanka, but Bollywood was just so dominant. Like, it was yeah. the monster. Like, it was the thing like that dominated entire South Asia. Absolutely. It's like a soft power, I say. Like a lot of South Asian countries that don't actually speak Hindi knew how to speak Hindi because of ba- like my mom, she grew up speaking Singhalese, but she knew how to speak Hindi because mm. of Bollywood, and that's how him, her, and my dad like fell in love. Like mm. she even knew how to speak the language before she met my dad. Um, she, my dad speaks Urdu, but they can communicate with each other, and I just thought that was so interesting—the idea of soft power of like mm. of movies, you know, in that part of the region. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think I have a lot of that. For me, the storytelling really is about like, I started like questioning so much about the world because of storytelling. And that's ultimately what I would love to do with my storytelling is just plant plant a little thing of a question that makes you go like, huh, why is this? Why is that? And then I think that really is the most powerful thing you can do because uh, it made me question so much about, especially so many injustices around me that yeah. was like normalized, quote unquote that I was like, oh, this is not okay to do this. And that was because I watched something and a seed got planted. And yeah. to me, that's the most powerful thing you can do as a storyteller sometimes. Absolutely. Or the end result of it, really. Yeah, amazing. Omar, right, how about you? It, it's very challenging for um, the Afghan diaspora to see any Afghan film. Um, because mm-hmm. It's just been in 40 years of just conflict. And, yeah. and whatever films that were in existence are trying to be archived or digitized uh, by some very, you know, important Afghan filmmakers from the region trying to save our cultural heritage. So it, it's it's been very difficult to find stuff. My parents weren't able to to show me things because, um, uh, as people know, there's some religious 
political fanatics that are uh, taking hostage of that country yeah. um, and burning and destroying our our cultural artistic heritage. So it's it's been more of a, in recent years, I just going on the pursuit to just trying to dig up and find these works. Yeah. So my my parents weren't able to show us that it wasn't accessible to us. And so what we ended up doing is I just remember growing up watching tons of music videos, either from Bollywood or from Iran. Very interesting. And so what that, you know, nurtured was just being open to like watching other other work, you know? So Very it was mostly watching music videos. <laughs> Very cool. All right, there's a lot of Bollywood influence today. No, it's super cool. <laughs> Talking about the soft power. <laughs> You're right. Exactly. <laughs> All righty. So at this moment, I would like to open the floor to audience questions. Everyone, please, please submit your questions in the chat box below, and I will get to as many of your questions as I can. While you guys are type, type, typing away, I would like to ask one of my final questions. Um, ending on a lighter note because it's been there's been a lot going on today. So, what was your favorite scene to shoot? A question for the both of you. Ooh, this is so interesting. Uh, I definitely loved. I think for me, um, I, I don't know about favorite. <laughs> the most stressful <laughs> scene was that last scene. <laughs> Because I felt I, 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 in retrospect, it's my favorite scene, but like shooting wise, it was the hardest scene because I was like, this is not going to work. This doesn't work. Yeah. It's the hitting of the hitting of the food on the tree. Yeah. Um, and then also the aftermath of when he gets a call about his dad's uh, dad's death. I was when I was shooting it, I was, I was like, this just doesn't feel right. Like nothing about this feels right. And I, I realized this because I was so I was trying to replicate that day of my entire my life. And that's why I wasn't feeling right. Because nothing I do will replicate my life on film, right? And I, I had to just stop. I had to, that's why I think like, because I was directing this with my with my partner and my DP was such a great collaborator. I, I, I lied on them and my DP was like, how about when he gets the call about his dad, we just cut to a wide. We don't stay on the close up. We just cut to that wide. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, let's just do it. And then editing that like saved me so much. I was like, this just makes sense. It's, good. it's amazing to go to that wide because we don't need to be with him. It's just so we understand what's happening. The, the the weight of that moment is so hard that staying on the close up would just be cat on a hat. Like it'd be too much. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's just I feel like with shooting emotional stuff is so important to sometimes disengage yourself, but at the same time you are making something very personal. So it's a hard balance. You have to wear multiple hats as a filmmaker. And then you're thinking about shot design. Then you're thinking about is my soup gonna hit and fall? Like all the logistical <laughs> stuff that you're like. Why the fuck am I thinking about soup? And it was just funny. It was just really, really funny, like um, emotional roller coaster of an experience. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Wow. Or how about you? Favorite scene? It, it, it's so. Str I agree. It's just so stressful to shoot, especially at this level, of independent filmmaking. I mean, like, like painfully independent filmmaking, where painfully you're just happy to, you're just happy <laughs> to get something in the camera, On camera. <laughs> um but there's a moment that that i think of fondly it's one of the last things we shot on the day where we're just outside like shooting gorilla style on the subway system of new york city um i needed an insert shot of this like advertising panel with like the little mobius strip image in it um so we just it was like myself uh the ad Fernanda and one of my producers, Jennifer, we just like walked into the subway cart and we just like, I found this empty uh, advertising panel and just real quickly, like, we didn't even like have to tell each other what to do. We just like, we ran over to it. I popped out the glass. We slipped in the little image that we wanted and put the glass back in. And then Andrea, the DP just came in and just like got the shot of the, <laughs> of the image and the people around us like, what, what is going, what's <laughs> happening? It, we, it's so funny. We didn't even discuss it, it, but it was just such synchronicity in that moment. We just like shot it, got in and we just got out. We left the image in the, in the panel <laughs> and the people in the summer was like, what, what just happened? <laughs> so that, that whole moment was such an adrenaline rush to like participate in like this guerrilla street art, uh, and filming it that, uh, when I think back on the film production, I call that was a little fun little moment. 
Very cool. That does sound very fun. <laughs> All righty. So now opening the floor, wow, uh, <laughs> to audience questions. We have a lot. We have a lot of audience questions. Um, <laughs> we have a lot. All right. My first one is from Cater It for both Omar and Aksa. What's the strangest or most unexpected reaction you've had to your films? I feel like ever uh, there are some like hardcore Blade Runner fans that recognize the location under the bridge in uh, in the film. <laughs> oh my God, no. I, I, I love Blade Runner. It's like one of my favorite films. So when I saw that in the opening, I'm like, oh, I know, I know. This is this is an LA. Uh, yeah, a classic. I did not yeah, I love it. So you said that. That's insane. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, that was like when I mean, people pointed that out. I was like, wow. People know their locations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh. that was that was really really nice. I was like, wow. Because yeah, I went into it like I was like, I want a location uh, like under the bridge, and my partner was like, oh, the Blade Runner bridge, and it's in LA. I'm like, it is. And then yeah, when I saw that, I was like, whoa, this is so perfect. It's just so the the, the composition, the geometry, everything, and I love that it's layered because it's about like this guy who's like underneath, like with the pressure of the society. So that is really cool to have something underneath the bridge. As he's looking up, it just feels so small. It just perfectly aligned thematically everything. So. Yeah, that, I, when I get that reaction from people, I just like, it just makes me smile because the film nerd in all of us just loves being film nerds with each other. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, in uh, Batman too, like Sean was saying in the comments. <laughs> Dang, you guys are good. Batman too, wow. <laughs> Um, I got so excited by the Blade Runner re reference and the whole <laughs> urbanism <laughs> composition of uh, Axel's film that I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was that was definitely a big moment for us here on the interview. <laughs> the question is, what's the strangest or most unexpected reaction you've had to your film from catering? Um, oh, it's like all over the board. This is very quick. I one of the first screens I had, um, someone this was a student film, um, and someone from Columbia's like office administration just like saw me in the theater, and I don't think she's ever seen any of my work. She just like hugged me. She's like, you like that was she she was speechless. She's like, you, you need to go, you need to see a, you need to see a doctor. <laughs> so that, that that's it. <laughs> she's concerned for you. She was concerned for like my my well-being and mental health. Uh, that's like every time I watch any Ari Esther movie, I'm like, I think I think we need some therapy sessions going on. <laughs> yeah, Ari need needs someone to talk to for sure. <laughs> That filmmaking is that therapy. That is true. That's, I think that's a very perfect reaction, Omar. I love that reaction, though. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. So then another question for the both of you from Mario. Um, Aksan Omar, did making these films change you at all? Yeah, I feel like for me as a as a, as a crafts from a craft perspective like I felt like the emotional like I talked about it kind of was like that catharsis moment but with from even from a craft perspective I've been wanting to tell a story um I've been wanting to craft a story this way for a while like this idea of suspense and thrill and like just underlying tension with sound design um for so long that I felt like I just wanted to I felt like when the story came along I was able to practice some of that craft and you know and do it uh, and I was just I feel like from now on like I know exactly where I need to hone in from a craft perspective. So I think it did change me as a filmmaker in that sense, like from a very, very craft. Sometimes you don't talk about the importance of that, like how art affects your craft. It just, it makes, it defines you like, oh, this is what I like to tell. This is why I like to tell this. And I like to tell it this way. Um, so I think as that, it definitely changed me. It made me hone in on my on my lens, I guess. Um, I would like to hope so. I um I I don't examine myself in that way, um. But definitely with each film I make, it's it's like a building block to the next thing. So there, again with 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 the craftsmanship, it's definitely something that uh I learned something from this film that I'm gonna take into the next film. And then as a human being, like spiritually, like I I feel like every filmmaker in a way is like in dialogue with themselves when they're making anything that they're making, you know. And so what that 
transformation or catharsis is. It's a, again, I don't know. Like I, 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 I purposely try not to examine myself in that way. Otherwise, I just like lose. Uh, I'm no longer living myself in real time. Mm. Very cool. So another audience question. This one is from Sean for Omar. And Sean, all right, Sean already really knows his stuff. So hold on. Needless to say, music and film go hand in hand. And the majority of your film is scoreless. Can you talk about your choice to use the song Gugush by Age Bemuni? Yeah, oh, this person really knows what they talk about. And the song and everything. <laughs> I think they they stayed and watched the credits all the way through. Yeah, Sean's um, not playing around, right? <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's funny when when I'm when we're making a film, it's not really a, the end product isn't exactly how we envisioned it. We just uh, especially again at, at the independent level, I'm just taking whatever I can, um, and putting together the the music. The very little music that I did have was a placeholder music. I was really hoping to have orchestration with this film, um, but that fell through. And luckily, this, the song that I did have, I was able to have my mentor at the time at Columbia reach out to with his network to get the permission to use it. Cool. Um, and so I, I, I very much would have liked to have had like a design, a sound design scape for the film. Uh, with very minimal uh, music to just like focus in on on the visuals and just have the music just like heighten the surreal nature of it. Um, but what ended up being the case was like using um, a foreign song, uh, a Persian song from Iran. Um, it just gave it another element of otherworldliness. Yeah. Um, I mean, anyone who speaks Farsi or Dari, they understand what's being said, but the rest of the audience like is being experienced by this um, different language that's giving the quality of like otherworldliness uh, and heightening the surreal experience of the film. Mm. Um, I hope that answers your question, Sean. Very, very cool. Super cool stuff. Alrighty, I will choose one more question and then I'll let that be it, but these, there's definitely a lot to choose from. <laughs> um, and I'll let our last one be from Mika. This is a question for both of you. Is this the genre you will stay with, or are you experimenting with other forms for your future work? That's a you know that's a question everybody always asks me. It's like, what genre? What genre would you work in? Like, mm -hmm. what kind of genre do you want to stay in? I I I find that question really hard to answer because my my films have been all over genre wise. I realized for me, really, at the end of the day, it's about story, and about the theme I'm exploring. And then the genre helps me get that there. Uh, so I definitely don't focus on this, like I'm only a horror person or I'm only a drama person. Um, I think it's about story and theme. And then genre is just a, 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 a like a craft thing to get get that out, out of me into a visual form. I, I totally agree. I love genre. Uh, I If I could only make genre films, I would. But it does come down to the story for me first. And genre is just like um, a vehicle to make it accessible to a broader audience. Um, I, I absolutely love science fiction. Science fiction is like what got me into filmmaking. Um, the projects that I was working on were science fiction projects where I plucked out the character and decided to put him in the story that I felt if I could use another genre was, you know, horror and horror or noir. But that's just there to help it. Uh, build up the world because at the end of the day, with Axel saying it's it's the stories first, and then and then I pull from other genres and mix and match to make something new. Very cool, mm -hmm. very cool. So to finish things off, I have to ask, what is next for each of you? What projects should we be looking forward to? Ooh. I am actually working on I just finished yesterday I was telling um you this morning that I finished my rewrite on the feature that, that I want to make yesterday so it was like a really crazy week trying to get that in yeah um but yeah it, it just it feels so good to to move on to a, a longer medium apart other than short because I've been doing shorts and I, I I would love to keep doing shorts like I'm gonna keep coming back to it because I like to torture myself you know shorts are so easy to make <laughs> in America 
Um, but I think shorts, is, it's a medium on its own. Some stories demand to be in a short form. Um, and I think you just get to practice your craft. It's so beautiful that way. But it was nice to like put a, put a full stop on a feature length thing right. and tell story in that form um, yesterday. So that's kind of my next focus. Amazing. And can we know what it's about? Just a little... Yeah, it's. Uh, I did this short film that got into South by last this this last March, and uh, the film is basically about um, like a version, like a longer version of that. Um, mm -hmm. That short film was supposed to be a proof of concept, but it deviated heavily into what the final end result of the feature is. But really, it's about like I was just trying to examine because I do so much com documentary commercials. Uh, and sometimes I just think about corporate America and how we like sell stuff and how much I'm, I'm facilitating that. Like I am actually helping them sell stuff. Um, and I just, I was exam, I wanted to examine that character, like a filmmaker who had to like end up doing commercials because she had to survive. And what does that mean as an artist? Uh, and then there is a genre element involved in it. Like Omar was saying, um, I really resonated with what he was saying. But yeah, it's this idea, like I just love this idea of like exploring something that's so personal to me, but using lens as a, using genre as a lens to highlight something that a simple drama cannot um, access. So yeah, that's kind of like where I'm, what I'm working on, but fingers crossed, it, it gets financing. <laughs> Awesome. Omar, how about you? What are you working on? It's, I'm working on myself, uh, Love it. to be honest. <laughs> it, as a filmmaker, especially independent filmmaker, you, you just, you're constantly fighting for your existence um, to be in the space. Um, but works that, uh, to answer your question more directly, um, I'm in the infancy of developing and researching a feature, but um, I recently finished a short script, potentially a pilot, that's a dystopian dark comedy following this Afghan American woman navigating Southern California in this like hyper techno capitalist world uh, where the gig economy has just gone to the point of just perversity and an un unsustainable existence for people in the world. Um, just exploring that in a in a sci-fi short. Very cool. Super exciting stuff. So, okay. Everyone just watched Short Film Saturday. They're obviously fans now. And now they know what cool stuff you have in the pipeline. How can people keep up with you? Is it through Instagram? Is it through a website? Should they just be checking your IMDb? Where should people be checking for you? And yeah, that's the question. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I definitely, I think Instagram, because of the whole Twitter thing. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get into that. <laughs> so Instagram is definitely where I, <laughs> whatever happened there. Uh, <laughs> so I think, yeah, Instagram is where I keep everything updated, posted. So uh, usually a uh, website is a good way for me, but Instagram is definitely where I post all the updates. Great. And what is your at, please? So everyone can type it in right now. Oh, it is my name, A Q S A. A L T A F Axalta. Perfect. And Omar, how about you? How do we keep up with you? Uh, I have such a measly social media footprint, um, but uh, I do have a social, uh, an Instagram account that uh, is active that you can reach me at. Perfect. And what is the at? Uh, it's Ohms, O M S uh, dot Kakar, K A K A R. All righty. Perfect. So everyone, make sure to go follow Aksa and Omar. Both of you, thank you so, so much for taking the time to chat with us today. It has been absolutely lovely. Very stimulating conversation. I have stuff to think about now. Like, I love it. Everyone, the new SoleilSpace.com website is up and running. It has been for a while now. So go check it out if you haven't already. You can find out all things Soleil Space and Short Film Saturdays there. Our next Short Film Saturday is not next week, but the week after, December 3rd, because we're taking a little break for Thanksgiving. We're giving thanks. Um, so yeah, December 3rd is when I will see you all next. And that's all she wrote. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.